Now, the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, calls itself the voice of business, claiming to speak on behalf of 190,000 businesses employing up to 7 million people. And according to the CBI, British businesses overwhelmingly back the idea of remaining in the EU. What's more, they've been encouraging their members to talk to staff about the referendum to give them, quote, the choice to hear what impact a Brexit would have on company growth, their jobs and the local community. Now, as you can imagine, Leave campaigners are not amused. The chair of the Vote Leave Business Council, John Longworth, a former director general of the British Chambers of Commerce, said the call was an anti-democratic abuse of power by the EU-funded CBI. He added, it's highly regrettable to see big corporate bosses plotting to gang up on their staff and to lecture them on how to vote. Well, we're joined now by the Director General of the CBI, Carolyn Fairburn. Welcome to the programme. Good morning. Now, if big business told its workers how to vote in a general election, there would be uproar. So why are you encouraging your members to warn their workers about the dangers of Brexit? Oh, to be absolutely clear, Andrew, that's not what we have said. Uh, what we have said is that workers, people working uh, t today in our, in our economy, want to hear from their employers about what it means on either side of the debate. But that's not what to you said. You said what impact Brexit would have on growth, jobs and the local community. Positive you didn't or say, negative. You didn't say, Positive or let's negative. hear about that. But you didn't say that. But I, this isn't this is absolutely clear. This was not about warning uh, uh, anybody. This is about the questions that people are now asking about what it means for them. We were very clear about that. But this most of your members, as you claim, are in favour of staying in the European Union. So the message that will be going out to the workforce will be overwhelmingly uh, about remaining in the EU. The, the main thing here is that people who are going to vote on the 23rd of June have as good an understanding as they possibly can for what it means for their, for their jobs, their families and their communities. And that was the key message. Okay. It was nothing about taking well, a side or telling people how to vote. We learned this week that one of your members, Serco, uh, was planning a pro-EU campaign with the Prime Minister even before the renegotiations were finished. Did the CBI or any other of your members have similar discussions with the government? Um, to my knowledge, no. Um, but what I would say is that um, the conversations that businesses, universities, um, all parts of a society have with, uh, with, with, with government go on every day. And but you were you planning the pro-EU campaign with the government even before the renegotiations had finished? No. So, because Circle was. No. So the, everything that the CBI has, has done has been a result of things that we have done with our members on behalf of our members. We have not had okay. those discussions. Now, Circle has contracts with the government worth several billion pounds. The taxpayer pays for that. Its boss, Rupert Soames, he was offering to do what he could to help the Prime Minister keep Britain in the EU. So there he is getting all these contracts and he says, the Prime Minister will help you. It was... It was a behind closed door stitch up between big government and big business, wasn't it? I, I think the really important thing here is to understand what businesses are saying across the country of all sizes. You're focusing here on one company. And what we are seeing in every day is um, a new voice of business, whether it's coming from farmers or from automotive, or saying uh, that the majority of businesses do want to I understand stay that, in the and European. I'm not That's arguing about really that. I'm, I'm, I'm just asking you if you think this, the way Serco has handled this, really. Uh, I mean, it, it does smell of a stitch-up. I don't think this is a stitch-up, Andrew. I think this is about voices of business being heard on issues to do with jobs and growth and the future prosperity well, of our country. And that is what... I mean, people can make their decisions on polling day about a whole variety of factors. But businesses who are every day trading with the European Union, having their voices clearly heard... I understand. Is, is and the circle's voice was certainly clearly heard, heard because he saw the Prime Minister, Mr Soames. Let me just show you what he then did in the following follow-up letter. He, he talked about backing uh, the Prime Minister's campaign to keep us in the EU, even though it was only in February, the renegotiations weren't finished. But he then went on, basically, to lobby for business. That He provides uh, private services to prisons, and he said, we discussed the oddity that persists in the supply of prison places. He wants more business at the same time. I mean, it really does add to the sense that this is big business feathering its own nest. But I don't think that's what uh, that's not what's going on at all. There are conversations but, all the time, Andrew. Was he wise you know to do that? that was he wise to, 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 to lobby for more business at the same time as lobbying to stay in the EU? Um, I, I think that there are conversations happening all the time. But and is it's that not conversation just... appropriate? 
Well, I think those are questions for other people. I mean, I stand for, the CBI represents many businesses across the UK, and you're picking on one. I think the important thing is that the voices of the many are heard in this. Well, are the voices of the many heard, though? Because the, the CBI, you get the impression you like the EU because it's a one-stop club for big business. There are 30,000 lobbyists in Brussels, most of them arguing for the interests of your kind of member, for big business. Ordinary folk don't get a look in. I just don't think that is true. You know, we've had 20 business surveys since the beginning of the year of all different sizes of business, Andrew, and they are all saying broadly the same thing. Not completely unanimous, absolutely accept that. Um, so um, we just had the Creative Industries uh, Forum coming, uh, coming out with a survey. 93% yeah. of creative, because they're big exporters, this is not just big no. business. This is all sizes of business. Well, Very but, important. But let's look at how the EU is good for your members, but not necessarily for the rest of us. The European Court of Justice, it's the ECJ, the Court of the EU, it has forced HMRC to hand back almost £8 billion pounds in tax paid by big British companies, overruling tax laws made by our government and our parliament. That's good for big business. It's not good for our public services. There are areas where we pool sovereignty in order to have a, a level playing field across Europe for businesses overall. We're not always going to like all of the rules. Well, a, but what, but it's, it's a question of whether the benefits outweigh the costs. Well, the benefits the, to your members are clear. They're paying eight billion less in tax. And the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility, it expects HMRC to pay another eight billion back by the end of the decade. And this is about tax avoidance. This is about moving your profits, moving your business to lower tax regimes and then not allowing HMRC to get the proper tax. I mean, that, that's not fair to, 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 to ordinary to, people. Well, to be absolutely clear, the CBI and businesses overall don't support aggressive tax avoidance um, and absolutely support the moves that have been taken at the OECD level to sort this out. So this is not something that is supported. But your members will be 16 billion better off and British schools and hospitals uh, and public services will be 16 billion worse off indeed. If the HMRC goes down in all of these cases, we could be 40 billion worse off. Good for big business, not good for the local school and hospital. Well, I don't know the exact details of those numbers you're talking about. But what I would say is that the, 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 the moves to, to improve tax policy are absolutely supported by our members. All right. The CBI has been wrong about Britain and the EU in the past. Why should we listen to you now? Um, I think this is becoming, to be honest, Andrew, I think it's becoming a distraction. So you, you, you're, where you are right is that um, when the euro was debated at the end of the 80s, mm. the CBI had an in principle but highly caveated position. Well, let's look at what you said at the time. First of all, you supported the Brit British membership of the European exchange mechanism. That ended in recession. Many people lost their homes and their jobs. You were enthusiastic. You then became enthusiastic, despite that, about the euro. UK membership of Monetary Union, that's the euro, has the potential to deliver significant benefits to the UK economy. So, so I ask again, if you were wrong then, why did we listen so to two, you now? So two, two important points here. If you had continued to scroll down, what you would have seen is that that was caveated by conditions that had to be met, which were around uh, harmonisation of inflation and harmonisation of economy. They mm. were never met. And so by 2000, the CBI had moved its position to neutral. But I make a more important point, which is that the discussion we're having now is actually about something very different. It's about the experience that we as an economy have had of the European Union for 43 mm. years now. We have thrived in it. We've gone from being the sick man of Europe to being the strong man of Europe. And businesses are doing well. They benefit from being part of a single market. Well. The, the euro was about something which people were imagining in the future. Very different debate, very different era. Well, let's come up to the current debate now because we saw what your stance was in the euro then uh, you now think we would be better off if we remain that's a clear-cut view of the CBI and of yeah. many of your members too you commissioned PwC their international consultants uh, to assess the economic impact of leaving the EU uh, and that's the summary of what they came up with there if we remain they think the economy will grow by 41 percent by 2030 but even if we were to come out and simply had free trade agreements, the economy would still grow by 39%. Even if we didn't have any free trade agreements, it would grow by 36%. I mean, it's hardly game-changing either way. Uh, we, we've, we've deliberately taken 
um, optimistic, balanced scenarios of the future. Because you're right, I mean, economies do recover, they do adapt. Mm. But what you have not shown here is the short term impact of um, several years of uncertainty. And what we believe, and many others believe as well, is that there could be significant short-term impact. I understand that, no that there sunlit, could be short No sunlit uplift. Well, so except that you can get to 39%. Our economy, that your own study shows our economy would be almost 40% bigger by 2030, even if we were to leave. That is if we do a trade deal with the US, uh, that we are able to, 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 re to form new relationships with the EU. These are optimistic assumptions. But the, well, but take the, the unoptimistic one or the non-optimistic world, the World Trade Organization, where we just, we just trade on existing WTO rules. It's 36%. But, it's but, but, still a huge rise but, in our economy. But I think this is... A of course we would continue to grow, Andrew. No one has ever said we wouldn't continue to grow. But will we be more prosperous? And the short well, we'd be 36% more prosperous. But, but the short run effect, so 2020, mm. we estimate that there will be a million fewer jobs mm. and a 4 to 5% hit to GDP. Do we want to do that to this next generation of school leavers? They've just come out of the financial recession. We're recovering very but well. But do you accept that in the long term the difference is not huge? But I think it's possible the economy would adapt. I think it's entirely possible, but, but, but only with significant short-term impact and mm -hmm. particularly impact on this next generation of, of, of school leavers. The CBI has claimed that each household benefits to the tune of £3,000 a year as a result of our EU membership. Independent observers have condemned that as a dishonest figure. Do you still stand by it? Um, we do stand by it. It was a literature survey mm. of, um, it, it, of existing mm. uh, studies um, because it was, we wanted to put together mm. something that was easy to understand. We're not saying it's accurate. We're not saying it's definitely the right number. It's not but we're, saying, but we're saying that it, because estimates like that are very difficult to do. And actually, to, as, you, uh, as you know, there was a range put around it. I mean, I think what we are saying, to put, be absolutely clear, standards of living have doubled since the UK joined the European Union. They've gone to about £20,000 household income to about £40,000 of household income. We are saying that a proportion of that has been as a result of membership of the right. European Union well, and that independent studies would support well, that. Except, and you're right, you did no original research for this at all. No, we never you claimed did, to. Was a, a, we I never understand claimed that, to. I'm explaining to our viewers. You simply did a survey of research papers but it turns out when you look, actually you cherry pick those research papers that had pro EU conclusions. That is you, not well, you true. Well, you, you did not use, I've got the list of the ones that mm. you didn't use here. You omitted the IOD, you admitted the National Institute for Economic and Social Research, you admitted the IEA, you even admitted the US Trade Commission uh, survey of what it meant, all to get this £3,000 figure, which Andrew, you now tell me isn't accurate. It is not true. The evaluation that we did of the different surveys, we omitted as many that were on one side as on the other side, and they were on the basis of very clearly set out criteria. There's a 20-page paper mm. on this, which anyone can go and read, which I sets have. out the methodology. I, very, I know, very but accurate. you just seem to be biased against those that didn't come to the conclusion you want. Ch I mean, don't take it from me. Channel 4's respected fact check concluded, quote, the figure is not based on any real evidence. The chairman of the Treasury Select Committee described it as, quote, a scandalous misuse use of data and intellectually dishonest. And we went back to him and we set out the facts because I don't think he had read the paper. It is not intended to be anything other than a, 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 an assessment of consensus views over the last 10 years. Just not, um, I, I mean, there's nobody more consensus than the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, but you didn't include that. The House of Commons Library did include these and gets a different result. I think that the really important thing now is to be focusing on what we, this would mean for the decision for, no, for the country. People, rather you're you're than telling people that households would be £3,000 a year worse off if we were to no, leave. No, that's not what the word Or you're saying no, that we're £3,000 better off by a, remaining. As a result of having joined. Uh, and to say that actually, say, I think about 15% of the increase in living standards over the time since joining is a result of being part of the European Union is an extremely reasonable and well-supported thing to have said. Is the CBI still keen in principle to join the euro? Absolutely not. I don't have uh, right. that conversation at any point. Okay, yeah, that's clear enough. Would you welcome further expansion of the EU? say, to include the five countries already in the queue? I think it has to depend on the conditions at the time. Uh, and the thing that is very clear is that we have a sovereign choice over those, uh, those additional uh, countries to enter. Would and I think you each welcome? One has to be taken. I mean, Turkey's a huge market. 
could be very good for British business. Would you welcome we haven't Turkey had the discussion. Joining? We haven't had that discussion with our members. We would have that discussion with our members at that time and have a point of view at that time. And just finally, the CBI welcomed both the Nice and the Lisbon treaties. They transferred substantial powers to Brussels. You were in favour of them. Would, would you welcome a further transfer of powers if we vote to remain? No. I, and I think that one of the things that is really clear is that we pool sovereignty where it's in the benefits of our economy and we don't where it isn't. Um, there's no particular move. And I would be say one thing, in terms of the opt-out from the Working Time Directive, a very important part of our uh, special arrangement, if you like, with the European Union, the CBI was fully part of and helped to negotiate. All right. Carolyn Fairburn, thank, thank you very you much for being indeed. with us. Now, depending